in the industry um, in, in local fish stores was the bread and butter fish. And that's the common clownfish that you see in uh, practically everybody's got one in their tank, whether it's the, the, the uh, wild type pattern or the, or the, um, or the, um, the pigment pattern uh, uh, deformities, mutations, whatever you want to call them, these, these designer clownfish. Uh, so all of these fish here um, I've bred and, and uh, worked with, whether it was the broodstock, the larvae, grow out, um, quarantining incoming fish for, for new broodstock, things like that, working with seahorses. Uh, so I got a lot of uh, experience under my belt at ORA. Um, working in all avenues of, of aquaculture, marine ornamental aquaculture. Um, and then after ORA, I went out to Hawaii, and that's where I got a lot of experience with uh, working with copepods. And, and, uh, and then I brought that knowledge and, and experience with me to Reed Bear Culture and, and started working with copepods at Reed. Um, and as many of you know, the copepods are very useful with, uh, you know, uh, our aquarium fish, uh, mandarin dragonets really like them, and they can be cultured and there's a variety of species out there that not just reef nutrition offers, but other, uh, other uh, companies offer them. Um, so it's really opened up a, 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 a huge world of opportunities for people that want to breed fish, keep, uh, you know, difficult species alive in, a, in, a, in an aquarium long term, things like that. So, so it's been fun to be a part of that. It's the copepod revolution. So uh, breeding um, marine ornamentals, uh, there's, you know, there, there are a, a wide variety of of uh, ornamental uh, fish that are being uh, captively bred in aquariums and in, in you know uh, big tanks in facilities all across the U.S. all across the world. Um, these are just uh, a few uh, popular ones that I'm I'm uh, a big fan of. Um, recently, tangs and butterflies and, and large angelfish have been bred successfully, and a lot of that success has been thanks to to copepods. Uh, so that's been fantastic stuff. Um, and, and then, you know, clownfish are pretty much one of the most common ones that's bred. That's, they're, they're very, they're very easy to breed. They're, they're like the guppies of, of the marine, of the marine world. And, um, a lot of people actually, uh, get their start with clownfish and then branch out from there and, and do other, uh, do other, uh, marine ornamentals. Uh, and, and so there's, you know, there's a variety of, of modes of reproduction with these animals. Um, the damsel fish and clownfish, uh, varieties are demersal spawners. Uh, so they tend to, lay their eggs um, on a substrate and, and tend to the brood. And then the, um, the eggs, uh, the embryos hatch and the larvae go out into the open ocean and hang out there for uh, a few weeks. And then they settle back down to the reef. And um, so they, they grow quite rapidly and, and get back to the reef quite, quite fast. Um, and so that's why they're, they're very uh, popular uh, to breed. Um, and, you know, you pretty much put two, two clownfish together that are young and they'll eventually form a pair and start breeding as, as some of you may know. Um, dotty backs are, are another um, popular fish in the um, marine ornamental um, trade, and they uh, actually um, create these little egg masses that they tend to, and um, and, and uh, uh, they they uh, they hatch like clownfish do, and you know you raise them for a few weeks, and they start going through metamorphosis and develop pigmentation. Um, cardinal fish are very interesting; they're very similar to some cichlids. Uh, in, in the world that um, they hold the eggs in the mouth. The males um, keep the egg mass in the mouth for a certain amount of time. And then they, uh, then they hatch out of the, the male's mouth. And, and many of them uh, either go through larval phases or they, or they hatch and look just like the uh, adults, uh, which is the case with the Bengai Cardinals. Um, and then seahorses and pipefish are, are very interesting. You know, they have a brood pouch, uh, the males do, and they raise the babies in, in that pouch and then they give birth and um, the seahorses, uh, just like the adults. Um, so yeah, modes of uh, reproduction, uh, gobies, angelfish. Um, so angelfish and, and butterflies, mandarins and tangs, these, uh, these guys don't, uh, these guys have a, a unique um, spawning, um, actually broadcast their eggs and, and the male will fertilize the eggs and then the eggs just drift away into the open ocean and and they're out there as larvae for, for weeks to months, depending on the species. Uh, so those guys are a little bit more difficult to work with. Their, their larvae are very, very small compared to a clownfish larvae. And so they require specialized feeds. Um, and copepods are, are currently um, the best feed for them. And, and that's how people have succeeded with, with those fish. Um, uh, okay, so so let's say that, uh, you know, you, you want fish breeding. And, and what I would recommend is that if you want to get into this, um, make sure that you have a very good plan because if you're successful, you could be, you could have 200 to 300 clownfish or 
in the case of the gold stripe maroons, if you're if you have a really good um, success rate, you know you're looking at close to a thousand fish that you could successfully raise, and then you got to have a plan on where what to do with those guys. You know whether you're going to sell them, give them away, uh, swap them out for other fish and corals, uh, and, and so it's it's always uh, wise to have a plan and figure out what you're going to do with these animals. Um, and there's you know there's because there are a lot of people breeding clownfish these days. Um, it's, it's very uncommon to find a wild collected clownfish in, in the hobby these days, um, because there's just so many breeders and, you know, there are big commercial breeders like ORA and Pro Aquatics and Sustainable and Sea and Reef, um, that, you know, these guys make their living doing this. And then there's breeders that have, you know, regular, uh, jobs and they do this as, as a side job to supplement their income. And, um, you know, they do it because they love it. It's, you know, you gotta have a passion for this kind of thing. And, and so they, they, um, these, these smaller time breeders tend to have more of the designer clowns, more of the unique pigment patterns, um, that, that people find in the, in the hobby. Uh, and so there's just, there's just a ton of people breeding clownfish, but like I said, they're, they're like the training wheels of marine ornamentals. So you get into clownfish breeding and then that opens you up, uh, to doing more species that maybe aren't as readily bred or, or people that or, or species that have never been bred at all in captivity. Um, and, and so it's kind of, it kind of opens the door. They're kind of the gateway uh, drug to marine ornamental aquaculture, so to speak. Um, and so typically what people do when they're choosing bridge stock is they'll choose, you know, very young fish, uh, ones that have unique pigment patterns or wild type patterns, uh, you know, no deformities, uh, skeletal deformities, uh, you know, missing uh, gill plates, things like that. Um, and typically two is all you need and, and one will become the female and the females are typically larger uh, in, clown, in the clownfish um, varieties, and and um, and they will start spawning. And once they stop start spawning, they can they can spawn for many many years. Um, in fact, there are some that are uh, some people have spawning pairs that have been going for over 20 years, which is just phenomenal. Um, so yeah, these are some things to look out for if you you know if you're looking to pair up some clownfish, looking for these deformities, looking for interesting pigment patterns. Um, Miss Bar, uh, you know, Platinums, there's just, uh, there's so many different names out there nowadays in pigment patterns that there's clownfish for anybody with any, you know, any unique desire to have a, a you know, a, a, a different looking fish than all the others. Um, and, but so, yeah, so once, once your fish starts spawning, um, that's, you know, when things start getting really interesting and, and, um, you know, we t I talked about spawning of, of some of these other, um, these other fish. And, you know, these are some images of, of the Bangai Cardinal holding the eggs in his mouth. And there's the clownfish laying a spawn down on a tile. Um, you know, I got the pot belly seahorses there with the male holding the, the fry in his pouch. Uh, and then there's a dotty back in the, in the bottom center, uh, with the egg mass. Um, and so this, you know, these are things that you're going to start seeing with clownfish and they will spawn on a variety of surfaces. They'll spawn on the glassier tank. They'll spawn on a floor tile. If you can, uh, it, you know, if you put one in there and you want to give it a go, they'll spawn on clay pots. Um, a lot of professional breeders prefer to get them to spawn on floor tiles and they set them up in their own tank and, you know, they're, they're not in a reef tank situation. Um, they're just, you know, pairs that are in, in small tanks and, and they spawn on the floor tiles and, and they're easy to, the eggs are easy to take out and, and hatch in a lover rearing tank. And same with the, the flower pots. Um, it can get really tricky if you want to raise some clownfish and they're spawning on your reef rock in your reef tank. Um, but there are ways to collect the larvae once they hatch. Uh, and I'll go over that in a little bit, but yeah, you'll see them, you know, you'll see them kind of doing this courting behavior. They kind of, the male looks like he's having like these seizures. He's kind of like chirping and, and squiggling around and, um, and you know, they, they almost look like they're fighting or, or it's, it's interesting when they're courting, uh, and then they'll start cleaning a spot in the tank, you know, whether it's near an anemone or in the back of the tank or on a rock, you'll see them kind of just, you know, nipping and, and cleaning the rocks off and cleaning all the algae and, and, you know, and beating all the other fish back, uh, that are in the tank. Cause these guys can be incredibly, uh, territorial. Um, you know, they are part of the damsel family and damsels can be pretty darn territorial. So. That's another thing to keep in mind is once these fish pair up and start spawning, uh, they are, they're, they're going to guard that nest, that little area of the tank, um, pretty, pretty heavily and just keep all the other fish away. Um, and so, so yeah, larvae, um, typically hatch early in the morning, uh, when it's still dark out, um, development, uh, of the embryos can take about eight to 10 days. This depends on the species. 
Um, and, and, you know, if, if you want to get good at this, there are other things that you need to be prepared for. And I'll talk about those in a little bit. Um, and so this, so let's say you got the clownfish spawning on, on a, you know, a piece of reef rock or your glass in your tank and you want to collect the larvae. Uh, this is the uh, Vossen larval trap. So what this is, it's a little acrylic box that Chad Vossen created with uh, Vossen Aquatics. Um, there's a, you can see the uh, aeration there on the left-hand side. What By that aeration is an LED light with a suction cup that you attach to the outside of the tank. Uh, and you set this up the night before. And what happens is the larvae hatch. They're attracted to that light. And as soon as they come near that, that airlift, they get sucked right into this, into this trap. And then they just tumble around. And that screen helps to, uh, you know, it allows for water circulation and keeping them oxygenated and they kind of tumble around in there until you wake up in the morning and and you bring them over and dump them in your larva rearing tank um and so this is this is really cool these are newly hatched clownfish larvae and this is what they look like they have kind of big silvery eyes and they still have a yolk sac um they don't exactly start feeding the second they hatch and they still are you know endogenously feeding off this yolk sac and then once that yolk sac depletes, they start exogenous feeding, and that's when you are going to start offering them a live feed organism. And one of the most common live feed organisms in clownfish aquaculture is the rotifer. Um, this is a very small animal that is native to many aquatic habitats across the world. Um, they're primarily found in freshwater and brackish water. Uh, some of them are colonial. Um, uh, many of them prefer to attach to surfaces and and feed off of whatever's passing by. They have this these cilia that you can see there at the top of their the top of their head, um, which is their corona or their crown. And these cilia um, look like a you know like a almost like a wheel that's spinning. And and that's kind of where they got their name. Rotifer means a wheel bearer. Um, and these cilia uh, they use these cilia to bring food particles in, or bacteria or whatever else that they're, you know, they're trying to scavenge from the water column. And then you can see there are these two like fist-like things in the center of the body. That's the mastax. And that's kind of the way that they crush their food and pulverize it and get it into their gut. And then they assimilate that nutrition into their body and, and uh, you know, use it to breed and grow and things like that. So we work with rotifers. We've been working with them for a, a long time, 16 years now. Um, we tend to run continuous cultures um, this is the species that we work with, Brachionis plicatilis, the L-type rotifer or large type rotifer. Um, they get a, a typical lorica length of 160 micron. Um, and the lorica is kind of this semi-rigid structure in the body. Um, uh, lorica, I think, is the Roman word for shield. Um, and, and so you can see here in this image that big round thing at the base of the rotifer attached to the foot. Uh, is is an egg, and basically rotifers are females uh, and, um, when they're happy and they're doing well, and they're just cloning themselves. Um, it's all asexual reproduction, uh, and they um, can be grown at very high density, um, and they are what they eat, basically. So we feed them our microalgae and basically turn them into this nutritionally valuable live feed organism, and this is what people in aquaculture do, whether you're working with clownfish or or food fish species. Um, and, and so phytoplankton that we have found is the best food item for them. Uh, you can also offer them lipids, um, you know, just straight lipid extracts. Uh, that can be a little bit harsh on them. So we tend to mix a little bit of lipids with our phytoplankton and also the phytoplankton themselves contain these lipids. Um, you know, phytoplankton are primary producers. So they're, they're producing things like omega-3 fatty acids and carotenoids. Um, you know, these different uh, pigmentation um, compounds that are in, in, the, in, the, in the microalgae. Um, and all that's passed on to the rotifer. The rotifer eventually assimilates that into its tissue, uh, not just into its gut. And then when the clownfish larvae eats it, it gains all that nutrition. Um, and so we, we offer a variety of, of products, whether it's equipment, feeds, uh, the live rotifers, um, the algae, you know, uh, equipment for separating the rotifers. These are things that we offer into the hobby and, and kind of products that we, we've been working on over the years uh, to make clownfish aquaculture just a little bit easier for people um, so that they can, you know, find everything all in one place. Uh, and, and of course, we provide all the technical, you know, uh, uh, specifications and, and all the, um, you know, help and tech support on these things. Uh, 
I've been, you know, I've, I've raised hundreds, hundreds of thousands of clownfish, so I can uh, certainly help people out with this. Um, but of course, there are a lot of nuances that you can't just get from a presentation. Uh, you know, it, it, once you once you get into this, um, there is a steep learning curve for sure. Um, and so here that we have a filter that we um, just uh, came out with last year. It's called the Rody Clean filter. This is just a simple hang on the back filter. And what it does is it uh, helps to um, export the waste in the rotor for culture. It keeps the rotor for suspended, keeps the, all the water churning and mixing. Um, and, and it also helps to oxygenate water uh, depending on the, uh, you know, the, the water depths, add an extra source of aeration to their, to their rotor for culture. Um, and, and, you know, really rotifers are, are a great life feed organism to work with. And it's something that we recommend that if anybody's getting into this, you get good at culture and rotifers first um, and, you know, and really make it a reliable uh, thing so that when you have clownfish larvae that are hatched and hungry, you have rotifers available for them. So here's a, here's a little video. This is the filter insert that I'm putting in. And um, that white material is, is what basically scavenges the organic waste, all the rotifer poop and all the organic, uh, you know, debris and gunk that develops in a, in a dense rotifer culture. And, uh, and, you know, this is just a filter that's been modified to handle rotifers going through it. They can be pumped through it without damaging the rotifer, without uh, killing the rotifer. And, and, uh, um, and, and uh, it, it actually um, works quite well. So we have a lot of people using this nowadays, and um, it's great to keep a continuous rotor for culture going with this method. Um, what you do basically is you're harvesting 20% of this culture every day uh, and removing the rotor first completely. And what this does is it keeps the rotor for culture young and vigorous. And it all, you're also doing a water change, you know, because you know, these things produce waste. And we all know that as waste builds up, it's very harmful to organisms and can cause problems. We may have lost Chad. Um, many of our uh, clownfish readers and people that are working. Yeah? It's still here. You got me? Am I there? Yeah, I can't see. Yeah. I don't see Might you. be the video causing from. Yeah. Am I frozen? I, I can't. I don't see you at all. You're here. I, I, I see him. Got me? Am I moving? It, you're frozen in your video, but your your order for yeah, video is it's, it's lagging. I feel like I'm gonna get booted. So let's stop the share screen for a minute and see what happens. Yeah, <clears throat> we dropped them. Um, so let's see if it pauses back, guys. Sorry about that. Just give us a minute while we work through this. There he is. All right, Sharon, got you back. All right, I'm back. Here we go. It's always fun to get booted. Okay. Just uh, allow me to share. 
Oh, hang on a sec. Go ahead, Chad. All right. Okay. All right. So, yeah, I was talking about feeding the RG Complete um, to your rotifers. This is our uh, marine microalgae blend. Uh, it also contains a, uh, uh, it's a, it's a feed and enrichment. So it gets the rotifers growing, helps them to reproduce, and it also enriches them. Um, and, and this product also contains an ammonia neutralizer and a pH buffer. Uh, so it makes it, it just makes life so much easier. You know, a lot of people will grow phytoplankton to uh, and that's perfectly acceptable, but there's people that just don't want to deal with it. They don't want to deal with growing the algae species and then enriching the rotifers and making them nutritionally valuable. So, so they, they, you know, they skip all of that and just buy a bottle of algae from us and, and go from there. And here's a video of a clownfish larvae going after the rotifers. You see those little white specks drifting around and they kind of coil up their tail and just, you know, dart forward and, and grab the rotifer, whether it's on the surface or in the water column. Uh, and so that's, you know, that's what they're doing all day long. Um, a lot of people will feed rotifers a couple of times a day. That way the rotifers uh, are young and enriched and, and remain active. Uh, and, and that way you're also not um, overfeeding the lava rearing tank because uh, too many rotifers can cause a lot of problems. They're consuming oxygen, they're producing a lot of waste, and they can pollute a lava rearing uh, Okay, and then so you're in the lava rearing tank and, and you've got your rotifers, your, your larvae have hatched. And so there's another technique that's used in aquaculture. Um, it's called green water technique, and this is basically just um, adding algae to the larva rearing tank. Uh, what this does is, is uh, it keeps the rotifers well fed. It keeps them enriched while they're being consumed by the larvae. Um, and this also uh, reduces or eliminates this nose bumping syndrome that we see in clownfish aquaculture where the larvae tend to uh, just pin themselves to the glass with their nose uh, and, and they don't swim around. And, and so once you add this green water into the larva ring tank, they tend to start swimming around and, and, uh, and staying off the glass. And uh, some breeders will black out the sides of the tank as well uh, to just make it a little bit more of a comfortable environment for the larvae. Okay, and so this is lagging. Gosh, I'm lagging. <laughs> okay, so this is a, a weaning chart that we developed because um, it's important to once you get your, your clownfish larvae eating rotifers and they're growing and going through metamorphosis, it's real important to get them off of those rotifers as fast as possible. And, and uh, one way to do that is with uh, a dry feed like TDO. Um, this is something that's very commonly used in aquaculture and marine ornamentals. A lot of people are using this food. It comes in a variety of sizes. Uh, the first size is TDOA and it's uh, 75 to 250 microns. So it's essentially the same size as a rotifer. Um, and, and so it's very useful. Um, a lot of people used to use Artemia brine shrimp to uh, get, you know, to train, to basically, you know, either they got the larvae on rotifers, the, the larvae go through metamorphosis, they get big enough that they can start consuming a newly hatched brine shrimp. Um, but newly hatched brine shrimp can be tough on the digestive system of, of clownfish larvae and many other, uh, other larval fish types. Uh, and so, um, and then also you got to hatch them every day because once uh, Artemia start going through their di different developmental stages. They start to lose nutritional value. Then you've got to start feeding them and enriching them and making sure that they're, they're nutritionally valuable. So a lot of people are skipping the Artemia and going straight to the TDO dry food. Um, and this is just a, a weaning chart that we developed based on uh, recommendations from breeders. And, and so you can see there how the, you know, weaning has an overlap. What a lot of people will do is they'll introduce the TDOA um, before they feed rotifers on any given day. Um, and that way, you know, you give the larvae a little bit of time to, to, you know, sniff the food, bump into it, and they really start taking to it within a couple of days. And then eventually you can just we cut the rotifers out. And then from there, it's, it's a lot easier to deal with. Um, and, and once you get them on a dry feed, you can start introducing more uh, complex filtration, more water current. These, you know, these, these fish are growing very rapidly. They're getting big. Um, and, and so they can, they can handle a lot more um, turbulence and things like that. Uh, this is a little weaning video. 
freeze up. But yeah, here's one. Here's a little guy going after. You can see that he's got his little head stripe coming along and it gets some pigmentation. So these fish are, are you know, I've already gone through metamorphosis. Some of them are actually going through it. And this is kind of what it looks like when they're going after the TDO. They're pecking at it and, and consuming it. And and this is uh, this is huge for a clownfish breeder. Once you once the larvae and the post metamorphic fish start doing this, um, you know it, it, it makes a breeder pretty happy because you've you've gotten you know you've gotten over a, a pretty big hurdle of of working with the uh, live feeds and and you know if you're just doing this for the for, you know just what in and out then you know you don't have to culture the rotifers anymore and then you're just feeding them this dry food and you, know, you can also you know, feed them fish eggs and and dead copepods and. Uh, frozen mysis and brine shrimp, things like that. Just a whole variety of things you can offer them once they're weaned off of those. Here's a bunch of them just really going at it, going after the food and, and eating it. And you know, these are these are tiny, tiny fish. These guys are like an eighth of an inch long, um, if even that. And and um, yeah, once they get onto this food, you can see they just start swarming around it, going crazy, and they fill their little bellies really full. And then whatever they don't eat, you know, you siphon off the bottom of the tank and do a water change and um, and go from there and, you know, rinse and repeat. Uh, and a lot of clownfish breeders have, you know, basically batches going. And so there's a batch that's newly hatched. There's a batch like this, one that's in grow out, one that's ready to be sold. Uh, so there's a variety of Get it back in a minute. You want me to text him? I'm sure he's coming back in now. He's trying. Or well, let me know if you want me to reach out to him. Okay. I want to know if we can use these Rotifers uh, for corals and uh, uh, other uh, filter feeding uh, animals or, or whatever. All right, guys, he's back. So he'll be joining us or, or taking over again. Sorry. There, there about he that. is. Uh, the this is the most I've ever been booted. This is... It's probably the videos. Uh, all right. So we were on the TDO. Yep. So this is the TDO here. Um, a lot of different particle sizes. This is our hobbyist breeder pack, um, which has, you know, the small sizes for weaning up to some of the larger sizes to feed your brood stock. And you can feed this to virtually any reef fish that you have. People are feeding it to corals, um, whether it's the powdered form to SBS, uh, or the, you know, the medium and the large pellets to, to larger fish. Uh, and you can see here that um, what we do with this food is um, we buy it from Japan, it's called Otohemi, and we top dress it with a freshwater algae species called Hematococcus pluvialis. And this algal species produces a red carotenoid uh, called astaxanthin. And this carotenoid is uh, very good at enhancing pigmentation, uh, especially in, clown, in, this, in these clownfish, um, specifically the species here. Uh, and it just makes them look more wild type. It gives them that nice deep orange or almost reddish coloration, um, which is uh, similar to their wild type uh, to the to the ones out on the reef. Um, and so, uh, and and also this uh, carotenoid acts as an antioxidant and uh, is really good for uh, promoting the health of the fish as well. So you can see here, this is a before and after. There we had a hobbyist uh, send us a picture of his clownfish, and you know it's kind of yellowish and faded and. After a month on TDO, it's got that rich wild type coloration. Um, carotenoids uh, are, are a big part of the diet of, of a lot of marine fish. And, and, and so um, it's good to get them into, the, into their bodies. And corals also color up, uh, get a much more rich coloration from when they're fed this, uh, when they're fed TDO. I'm not gonna play this video, I'm gonna skip it. Um, so yeah, once, you, once you're getting your fish, you know, once they're growing and getting bigger and you're getting them into the grow out, you know, you're basically looking at them every day. You're size sorting them because they will kill each other. They will fight. The bigger ones will beat up on the smaller ones and also doing sorting for deformities and 
Um, uh, broodstock selection is, is happening as well. You know, you're starting to see interesting pigment patterns and you're going to save those and, and breed those guys and uh, create something very unique, um, you know, as far as pigment pattern goes. Uh, you're also uh, observing them and keeping an eye on disease and things like that. Um, we would commonly find a, a disease called amelodinium um, in our clownfish. And, you know, there's different treatments, cupramine, uh, you know, copper is one of them. And then uh, once they get big enough, you know, inch and a half, uh, you know, they're ready to be sold. And, you know, then you got to gotta be good at selling them. If you can drive them to a pet store or, or you know, to a friend or whatever, that's awesome. If not, you're going to have to learn how to bag them up and ship them um, to market. And, and so there's a lot to, lot to consider um, when, you're, when these guys are getting ready to go out the door. And also, you know, these, these things are very important to pay attention to, uh, especially disease, because, you know, you put all this work into these fish and, and uh, you know, you get them to maybe day 60 or day 90 and you're getting close to selling them and then they all get sick and die. So it's just um, can be really, really painful to deal with. So you really got to be on top of your game and, uh, you know, keep the water quality uh, as, as good as possible and, and get them out the door. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is something that's very important is biosecurity. Um, this is, you know, basically preventing, uh, you know, your, your facility from getting uh, disease and, and uh, exotic uh, organisms and, and things that, you know, just can wreak havoc on your, on your um, operation. This is something we, we take very seriously at, at Reed Mariculture. Um, you know, we look, at, look for uh, vectors of, of transmission of disease and contamination. Um, and, you know, humans are, are a big vector. You know, we if, if you're dipping your hands in your reef tank and then you're going over and dipping your hands in your larva rearing tank, you could potentially do something that could hurt the larvae. Uh, you could also get the larvae sick um, unknowingly. Um, we, you know, we, we have uh, basically compartmentalized our, our facilities. So only certain, amount, certain people are allowed in certain areas, like our rotor for guy. We have a rotor for room and he's the only one allowed in there. I'm not allowed in there because I don't want to contaminate the rotifers with copepods. And we and he's not allowed to go into algae production because we don't want his rotifers in our algae production, and I don't want him in my copepod. So we do all these things to to kind of mitigate this contamination. We don't allow dogs and pets, and we never share equipment and um, things like that. So uh, you know these these things are important to to keep things running smoothly, um, and you know and not have any interruptions. Um, then quarantining fish is, is a good idea if you're bringing in new brood stock. Uh, quarantining is important, and I, you know I would advise you to look into that and. And then diseases is something to read up on and, and learn about um, and know what to look for. So yeah, that was a, that was an okay talk. Sorry about the <laughs> getting booted. Um, but yeah, if anybody has any questions, uh, let me know. Stop. There, there, yes. Uh, well, thank you. First of all, um, there are a few questions. Um, one of them, let me give me one second to find them here. Um, is there a specific temperature that you sh do you recommend keeping to breed to be able to breed the clownfish, or yeah, do, do they prefer a specific temperature? Commonly, people run them at between seventy-eight and eighty degrees. Um, I know some breeders that will run their larvae really warm at you know upwards of eighty-three degrees. Uh, that will get those larvae to grow really fast. Um, but you know, you just got to be careful with the higher temps, um, you know, with low oxygen and, and, uh, and, and waste issues and things like that. But yeah, the 78 to 80 degrees is, is pretty common. Um, you know, whatever people are running their reef tanks at those temperatures, upper seventies, uh, you know, clownfish will spawn in that. No problem. Um, how do you select pairs or create pairs? Do you select them? Willy nilly, or just you know, let them pair up on their own, or do you force pair them? How do you do it? So yeah, you know, typically you can take a couple of very young clownfish that are under a year old. If you just want to create a pair, you just get two of them, put them in a tank, and eventually, you know, they're they're going to be both male, and one of them will uh, go through um, a sex change and become female, and you've got a pair. Um, there, other people will have like a situation where they have a group of clownfish in a tank and. And what they will do is they will, um, two of them will develop into a pair and the other ones will just remain kind of non males and they won't pair up either. And you'll just have that one pair with a bunch of clown fish that aren't really breeding. Um, so that's commonly what people do. And you can also buy pairs. There are people that 
that set up pairs, establish them and, and sell them as, as, a, as a pair or even as a breeding pair. Um, I know some breeders that, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll have their fish breeding for like five, six years, and then they'll rotate them out of production and sell the pair. But that pair will continue to breed for many years to come. Uh, and of course, there's, you know, there's, a, there's a, a, always a, a time frame where, you know, you're transferring a pair or a couple of clownfish from one tank to another. They're gonna, it's going to take them a while to either get back to breeding if they were before or to develop that relationship and start spawning for the first time. Um, that stuff takes time. It can take months or, or, even, or even years. Um, and, and also, you know, it's, it's good to keep that water quality consistent and feeding your broodstock pair as many times a day with a, a, a wide variety of foods as possible. Um, and when I was at ORA, we were feeding our broodstock seven times a day with everything we could throw at them. Uh, and and that, was, that was really helpful to really just fattening them up, getting them breeding. And the other thing that's important is once these fish start breeding, uh, they typically have, like the embryos typically don't develop right. Their fertilization rates are low. Survival is low with the first few spawns. Um, so a lot of people will just let them spawn for three or four times, and then they'll start trying to raise them. Um, and, and you'll see this when a new pair starts spawning, they'll they'll lay down a few eggs, maybe some of them will turn white and there'll be a couple that develop all the way through. And then the second time around, you'll see more eggs and, and more, uh, you know, good fertilization and survival. And the third time around, you, it's just going to, you're going to see it. It's going to be better and better. Um, and it's really cool if you can catch them in the, in, in the moment of spawning. Um, you'll see the, the females got this little tube, this ovipositor that kind of pops out and she'll just skim the, skim the surface and just lay the eggs down and they stick to whatever surface there she's cruising on. And then the male comes in and he's kind of doing his fertilization thing and releasing his sperm. So um, if you can catch him in the act, it's really cool. And there's some videos on YouTube of people that have, have uh, filmed it. Um, Tony Berry asked a question. Uh, he's been doing this for about 34 years, um, but he can't figure out why um, he's he has fish that are constantly laying eggs. You know, he has clutches of eggs all the time, um, but they, for some reason, don't make it past day four. You know, he'll wake up one morning and they're all gone. Um, any clue as to why or what's going on? Uh, you know, it's we always, when that happens, we always want to look at water quality. And, and you know, obviously, if you're checking pH and ammonia, um, those are those are things that are that are very important to look at. Um, I always recommend that you start off with new, clean salt water, uh, and, and you know, of course, it helps if you're using reverse osmosis deionized water. That's that's huge. Um, and also, you know, the the quality of the live feed organism. You know, if you're doing this with rotifers, that rotifer has to be nutritionally valuable, um, or those larvae aren't going to get what they need to grow, and and it, they just die off. Um, and, and so those are just some important things to look at. And also brood, broodstock nutrition, um, just feeding the broodstock more often, you know, mixing it up, different kinds of foods. You can feed them, um, there's, you know, copepods, like we sell arctopods, which is a pod that you can feed them. Um, our TDO is a really good dry feed for them. It's very nutrient dense, and that's easy to just throw some TDO at them two or three times a day. Um, you know, small amounts of feeding, small amounts multiple times throughout the day is, is, is ideal for these animals. And then, you know, and then just making sure that they're happy in, you know, in their environment and the water quality is consistent. Um, and, and so, yeah, there's, you know, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot that goes into it. So yeah, if you, if you, if you want to get on the phone with me, um, uh, you know, you can, you can reach out to our tech support or, or just call us at, at Reef Nutrition, um, and I'd be more than happy to, you know, troubleshoot and figure out what's going on. Um, he was also asking about your rotter for culture kit. Um, what's the, the cost of that? And he can get it online. Yeah, you can buy it online and let's see here. I'm going to look at it real quick. Um, I don't have the price memorized. Um, it is, so it's $200 for the entire, uh, clownfish breeder pack. Um, and yeah, that's that you can, that you can only buy from us directly. That's not something that you would find in, in a local fish store. Um, he's saying how he feeds 27 different diets. 
I'm not sure what you mean by that. Um, Tony, do you want to unmute yourself? Perhaps and ask him. I'm not sure what you meant by 20 different, 27 different diets. Tony, you there? Okay. Uh, yes. I'm referring to, um, as far as fish foods, I have 27 different types. Um, Hikari, San Francisco Bay, LRS, Rods. Um, I, there's a whole variety of foods that I feed. Um, so, I mean, they're getting, uh, obviously a, a proper diet. I don't feed 27 in one night, but you know, four or five different things mixed, uh, on a given feeding. Yeah. So you got bridge stock nutrition covered. Yeah. That sounds, that sounds good. So it's, yeah. And then your. Yeah. As far as the water quality, um, I don't change water often. This tank I'm referring to is a 660 gallon. And I use Hannah and Sal for kits, and I do roughly six to eight um, uh, uh, ICP tests uh, uh, on a given annual basis, and they always come out uh, dug on near perfect. Interesting. Yeah. You know, sometimes pears just don't, it just, for whatever reason, it just, they just can't, they're not successful. Like the larvae that are being produced are just, for whatever reason, they, they just don't make it. And the pair is just, I don't know, maybe the female has something wrong with her. She's not developing eggs properly, or there's something wrong with the way that the embryos develop genetically. Uh, and so sometimes it just doesn't work out. We've had these situations at ORA and we would just, we just retire the pair and set up a new pair and, and go from there. Um, but you know, that's, you know, if they're dying in four days, that's just, that's strange. I mean, that's, you know, that could be starvation. They could, and I don't know if, you know, if you're feeding them enough rotifers or if, you know, the water quality in the larva rearing tank has to be really good. You know, people are siphoning every day, doing water changes every day um, in a larva rearing tank, um, you know, not, and not having a lot of water current, very little aeration uh, so that they're not getting banged around using the green water properly, uh, things like that. So now just to clarify, um, I'm referring, do eggs, I, um, four days with eggs. I, I've never had larvae yet. Uh, oh, okay. it's f after f about day number four, I wake up one morning, those eggs are gone. Sounds like they're eating them. That's what I'm wondering. Yeah, they, they'll do that. And sometimes when they do that, they just never, they never stop. Yeah, I have three breeding pair right now, and we're talking about um, probably the last six to eight uh, clutches of eggs. I mean, this happens all the time with three different pairs. All the pairs are doing it? Yep. It's weird. <laughs> That's weird. That's weird. That's very weird. Huh. And, th and they have like a night cycle, right? Like it's dark in the house at night when they're, when lights are yeah. out. Um, I have a single moonlight. It's so different. Uh, Ankle almost looks to be dark. That's strange. It uh, is. Yeah. <laughs> that's really weird. That's some kind of in, something environmental. That's uh, there's something going on. Hmm. That's weird. You stumped me. <laughs> I think it's like a camera on it. <laughs> yeah. Put a camera and and record it. You know, start recording on day three and see what happens. That's, uh, that's gonna be my uh, my route. Yeah. Are yeah. the pairs are the pairs all by themselves in tanks? No. Um. There's roughly thirty eight to forty fish in with them. Something else could be eating them in the tank. Yeah, it would have to be probably the anthias firefish. It won't be the tang that I know something, everybody. Something has uh, has a, a a thirst for clownfish eggs now. Something's eating them. Something has figured out a, a consistent source of food, and they're loving it. Yeah, could be a could be an invert too. Some inverts will do that. Yeah, uh, yeah. snails, shrimp. Question on on rotifers um, and corals. Do corals consume rotifers? Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. SPS corals will eat them all the way up to LPS and. Uh, you know, leather corals, uh, things like that. They'll they will definitely eat a rotifer. In fact, there are there are stores and hobbyists that culture rotifers just to feed to their corals. 
because uh, it's a great way to get some phytoplankton into your corals, all that nutrition from phytoplankton, whereas some corals don't commonly consume phytoplankton, but they will eat a, a little live animal that they're capturing with their polyps and, and, and consuming. So you can get a lot of nutrition into that rotifer and then transfer that on to your coral polyps, to your colonies. Uh, so yeah, absolutely corals will eat rotifers. And, and if you don't want to call through rotifers, we also have a product called Rody Feast. Um, our six ounce bottle has 5 million fully enriched rotifers and, and a lot of people use Rody Feast to feed to SPS corals and LPS corals and you know uh, soft corals and, and non photosynthetic argonians, things like that. So that's uh, yeah, absolutely, you can feed rotifers to corals, live or dead. Do you think, uh... Let me see if I can understand this question. Um, can captive bred fish have or pre, be predispositioned to have things like lateral line disease, or you know, and 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 have it stem from improper diet when they were reared? Does that make sense? Did I say it correctly? Yeah. Um... That's kind of a, yeah, that's an interesting topic. A lot of people have wondered that. We've always, we've always wondered that if medicating, like if, like if a clownfish gets, you know, Brooklynella or something, some kind of terrible disease and you medicate them with formalin. And we've always wondered if that affects the way the female produces eggs or the way the sperm is produced. And if it, if it, you know, messes it up on a genetic level and then uh, you know, those fish that are raised uh, tend to be weak, have a weak immune systems things like that. Um, I know that if, if larvae are not raised on a nutritious diet of, you know, things like fatty acids and, and vitamins and minerals and proteins and, you know, all these things that go into a life feed organism, they, they can um, be, have a weak immune system for sure. Uh, and, and so that, you know, that there's definitely some, some credence to that. Okay. Fish would grow up and be more prone to disease, um, but eh, it's a lot of that's anecdotal. <laughs> I don't know if there's any scientific work that's been done on that to, you know, induce that kind of thing. I don't even know how you would go about it. Yeah. Um, great. Uh, there's a couple more questions that just popped up. One second. Uh, have you tried hybrid breeding on other species or just clownfish? This is coming. Yeah, from there's, there's a lot of hybridization that's going on for sure. There's the um, Poma labs, I believe has done some hybridization of the, of, you know, the big angel fish. Um, and you, I know there's, we did some hybridization with the dotty backs with Pseudochromis. Um, I think we crossed a Fridmani, the orchid dotty back with a Sankii, the little striped dotty back, the black and white one. Um, and so, yeah, there's, there's absolutely uh, some hybridization that can be done for sure. Um, but I think it's only within the genus. I, I don't think you could go outside of a genus and do that. It could get tricky, but, but it, it may be done. I don't know. Um, one more question. How difficult, in your opinion, would it be to, to start growing the rotifers with your culture? I mean, is it something that any – regular hobbies can do. Yeah, culture and rotifers is, yeah, as long as you, you know, you, you do the research and put in your work and ask questions and ask other people that are having success with rotifers, uh, anybody can culture a rotifer. Mm -hmm. Any other question, guys? Uh, that seems to be all the questions that have popped up in the chat here. Eddie, I know you had some questions that you were talking about beforehand. Are you there? Well, yeah, I, I'm, I'm the one that asked the questions about rotifers. And coral. I, I'm a coral guy. Uh, you know, I, there's no secret here. Uh, I'm a coral guy, and, and I'm glad to hear, uh, you know, about the, the rotifer um, ability to, uh, uh, to col cultivate rotifers at home. Now, that being said, uh, before I do that, if you're saying you have a bottle that has 5 million of them, uh, why would I bother? Uh, but that being said, okay, I put 5 million rotifers uh, from a bottle of yours in my tank. I've got filter socks. I've got a protein skimmer. Uh, what, what happens then? Are they that small that they won't get picked up by filter socks or, or a protein skimmer? 
So basically the, the rotifers and the roti feast, you would just feed small amounts from our bottle. You wouldn't dump the whole bottle in. You would, you know, basically feed like a teaspoon per hundred gallons. And, you know, and some people will turn off their research and, and just let the rotifers drift around in the tank and let the corals capture them and consume them. And then turn the, turn the return, you know, the research pump back on. Um, I know some people that will do this when they're feeding corals in general. Uh, they'll let those corals just as long as possible uh, to consume as much of it as possible. And then they'll, they'll fire their filters back up. Um, and so with our roti feast, yeah, you're, you know, you're looking to add, you know, very small amounts of that food on a daily basis or every other day um, to feed your corals. And you can target feed this stuff as well. Now it, it's hard to feed a, a, a 200 gallon tank full of uh, staghorn, uh, you know, uh, stag corals and stuff like that. So, but, okay. But that being said, uh, <clears throat> when you say, I, I saw the, this little system that you have, it's like a five gallon bucket with a special filter and blah, blah, blah. Uh, how many would do you calculate I can grow in there, let's say in a week? Well, you could, you could harvest a million rotifers a day from that system. <laughs> oh, God. And that's, so that, and that's, that's like the lowest, that's like a very low amount of rotifers you could ha harvest from that bucket. Um, we, we harvest close to five million rotifers a day from a five gallon bucket but we're feeding them a lot of algae with a dosing pump. So the algae is constantly being dosed into the bucket. Um, but you can get a rotifer culture quite dense. Um, you know, we're talking upwards of 1,000 to 2,000 rotifers per milliliter, uh, which is just, that's why the such a great life. Okay. okay, so let's say I do it once a month and Our, I bottle it. What's that? Let's say I do it once a month and I, and I bottle it and put it in my fridge uh, to uh, last me um, a couple of months. I don't know. I'm asking. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, it's it, that's I mean, you can so you can freeze rotifers for sure. You could harvest them and freeze them. Um, but, you know, I, I, as far as how long they would last in a freezer, I'm not sure. Um, that's not something you would commonly do. You would yeah, but, but at that point, yeah, but at that point, they're dead. If they're frozen, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I'm, I'm talking about live. So if you're if you're do, if you're working with a rotifer culture, you're going to need to harvest it almost every day. That, that's just the way a rotifer culture runs. If you're going to do a continuous culture, if you're going to do them in batches, you're going to need to run multiple buckets. And once one gets dense, you harvest the whole thing, and you boom, you blast it out to your your animals. And yeah, then that's too much. In line, and the next one, and then the next one. That's what people do. It's called batch culture. What we do is. It's a continuous culture. So we harvest 25% of our culture every single day, no matter what. And then those rotifers get, you know, put into bottles, they get whatever, they get processed. For you, it would just be, you would harvest the rotifers and feed it to your reef tank every day. And your corals would be just, it would be a buffet of rotifers. Um, right. Someone just Thank asked, you. someone just asked if they can put the rotifers in the refugium to supply live food for the main tank. And would there be any chance of them breeding just like pods or no? That, you know, that's, that's something that I think could be done if you paid a lot of attention to it and took samples and had a microscope because it, in a, in a calm water scenario where if you have a refugium and there's not a lot of water flowing through it, the rotifers, they prefer to attach to things. They have a foot and they secrete an adhesive uh, out of the end of their foot and they'll stick to things and then they'll just, grab food particles as they come by. Um, and so uh, it's, it's possible that a road that rotifers can colonize a refugium. Um, they do need to be fed routinely. Um, they need to be fed a very small particulate feed like phytoplankton as often as you can. You know, some people could dose the algae into the refugium uh, throughout the day. You know, every hour, a small amount of algae goes into the refugium to feed the rotifers. Um, but I, you know, I just, I, I don't think that they would reproduce rapidly enough in, in, in a refugium to, to feed a display tank. I just, I just don't think it's possible The the best way to do it would just be in a, in a, in a, um, external culture in a bucket or something. Um, let's see. How Someone many, they just tried to, okay, go ahead, go ahead. Jesus. How are you? Good buddy. 
Um, Chad, how many broods do you think you could raise with your 25% harvest from one bucket? Uh, from one bucket, I think you could raise anywhere from three to four batches of larvae. Okay, so you, you could raise the offspring of three to four pairs, theoretically, running off one bucket. Yep. Okay. Easily. Okay. Yep, as long as, you're, as long as you're maxing out the density. And, and also, one thing I recommend is, is if you're really looking to get serious with rotifer culture, get a microscope and learn how to count rotifers do daily counts. That way you know exactly what's going on in the rotor for culture. Um, you know if, if their population is decreasing or if it's increasing. Also, when you harvest, it's great to you know, put that harvested amount of rotifers in a, in a, in a, in a uh, measured volume, take a sample from that, you know, homogenize them with aeration or something, take a sample from that harvested um, you know, um, batch and, and take a one mil sample, put them under a microscope, you can, you can kill them with iodine or, or vinegar, and then you count those rotifers, and that way you know exactly how many you've harvested. And you really gain a lot of control when you work with a microscope with these animals. Plus you can, you can observe their swimming patterns. Um, a, a rotifer that's nice and, and robust is one that's well fed and doing well. You can also look at the eggs on the foot if they're producing of eggs. Uh, some rotifers will hold like four to five eggs on their foot, which just is a very good sign that they're very healthy. They're, you know, whatever you're doing, they're loving it. Um, and, and so microscopic evaluation is huge. It's something I highly recommend if you really want to get a firm grasp on rotifer culture. What size objective would I need to see rotifers? Because I tried looking at phytoplankton, um, like nanochloropsis through a microscope. And we have four objective microscopes and I couldn't see anything. Yeah. Nano is very small. You know, you're talking one to two micron. It's tiny, tiny. A hundred X magnification is, is, is good for that. Um, but you know, 10 X 40 X for a rotifer is sufficient. Okay. Yeah, totally fine. Yeah. You don't need to go out of your way and to buy a super expensive microscope to look, to count rotifers and look at rotifers. Um, we actually have information on our website on, well, the equipment we recommend for counting rotifers. There's this. Uh, okay. There's this counting slide called a Sedgwick Rafter counting slide. Yeah. It's exactly one milliliter of of water of liquid, and you put the rotifers in there, and you count them all, and that's one mil. And then you multiply that times your volume. You know, however many milliliters you have, and uh, you know, and it's always good to use a metric system, of course. <laughs> right. You can calculate your density. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Chad, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, this is the gentleman I was referring to uh, yeah. earlier. Before uh, Jesus is one of the uh, one of the high schools that we support here in South Florida. Uh, he, uh, in, in addition to the reef tank that he's got running, uh, he uh, recently started in uh, getting some broodstock uh, to start doing what we're talking about here today. So, uh, you know, we're happy Jesus is helping his kids at his high school, and and our club is is happy to support him. And, and everything that we can, and, and, and we're, we're glad that, uh, that you're able to help them. Awesome. Yeah. Um, hey, Jesus, please reach out to me, Chad, at readmariculture.com is my email. Um, okay. For a, a uh, credit for educators, $200 okay. a year. And okay. so we can get you what you need at, at no cost. Thank you. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Chad. Um, Chad, uh, someone typed that your clownfish starter kit shows out of stock online. Um, I guess someone went online to, to try purchasing it and, and it says out of stock. Do you know yeah. when you're going to have them back in stock again? It's, it's in stock. We, we forgot. We didn't. Um, I actually talked to our customer service people to have them remove that out of stock because uh, it, it is in stock. Okay. Um, and how long do they last in the bottle? I'm assuming they're talking about the rotter furs or your pods and stuff. The, so the, the dead furs and roadie feast have a shelf life or a best buy of nine months. That doesn't necessarily mean at nine months, they all explode and the bottle goes rancid instantly. You know, it's, it, it's just one of those things where we kind of give you a rough idea that it's good for nine months, but you can continue to feed it as long as it doesn't change color and smell like rotten eggs smell weird um as far as the live rotifers go we just basically ship them in, in one million um 
uh, densities or 5 million density in a, in a breathable bag. So we use these bags that allow for oxygen and, and uh, exchange and carbon dioxide exchange. They're, they're gas permeable. Um, and we ship those anywhere from two to five days. You know, we have international customers that buy rotifers and, and, and these live rotifers can remain in a bag for five days. There are some mortalities, but they don't completely die off. Um, and it's just a great way for people to get rotifers. And also, you know, if, we're, if your rotifers crash and you have a catastrophe, we're here, you know, we, we're always producing them. We have them at all times. Um, and so that's a, that's good peace of mind for people that are working with these animals and, and they're relying on, on their rotifer culture. If, if, it, if it all fails, you know, you, you got to back up with reed mariculture. Do you carry Arctic, Arctic pods? Yes, yeah, we carry a, a Calanus uh, genus, um, Arct Arc uh, copepod that's, you know, from the Arctic waters. And yeah, we call it Arctipods. And copepods are a great source of nutrition. Um, there are actually some clownfish breeders that use copepods as a first life feed organism for their clownfish uh, for like a day or two, and then they get them onto rotifers because uh, copepods are, are just an incredibly good source of nutrition for uh, larval fish. Uh, basically the, you know, the Oceanic Institute that had success with the yellow tangs and continues to have success, they would not be able to raise those larval yellow tangs without copepods. Um, they're definitely not using rotifers. Uh, and so, you know, if you're looking to do more difficult species that have very small larvae, you absolutely want to look into copepod culture. Uh, and, and we have a copepod, uh, Parvocalinus is the genus. And that's the one that a lot of these um, uh, breeders are using on these incredibly difficult species. Um, and, and some breeders that, you know, live near coastal zones and they go out and they tow plankton and, and you know, whatever they capture, they sit it and toss it into the larva rearing tank and that's how they do it. Um, but, but with, you know, with companies that have life feed organisms, copepods and rotifers, uh, you know, just about anybody can breed fish nowadays. You know, somebody in, in Missouri in the middle of the U S can, can raise, uh, raise fish, um, because they don't, you know, they're nowhere near the ocean, but they now have access to live feed organisms and live algae or dead algae and, and weaning diets and things like that. So it, these kinds of innovations and companies that work with these organisms that have really ex helped to accelerate aquaculture in, in ways that we just never imagined. So it's, you know, it's really cool to be a part of that. Hey, Ben. Um, two questions. Uh, so Arctic pods and copepods are the same? Yes, the arctipods are a copepod. Okay. And then the other question, um, this person buys a variety of your products about once a month and just pours a small bottle into the tank. Um, is he doing anything for the fish? He's not trying to breed anything. He's just wondering if it's beneficial to the fish that are currently in the tank, the fish and corals, or no. Uh, I don't I'm Depends sure. on what the product is. I'm assuming it's our live copepod. Um, some people will do that. Assuming, yeah. Yeah. Some people routinely add copepods to their tank and um, you know, it's, it's good to have zoo, zooplankton in a tank. Copepods are, are a good part of it can be a good part of the ecosystem. And, you know, they eat organic waste, they eat diatoms and, and algae and um, yeah, they get eaten by other things. Corals will eat them. Um, other crustaceans, amphipods will eat them. Um, some fish will eat them if they get into the water column and they pop off the glass or off the rocks. Uh, yeah, I was just texted. He feeds for his dragon nets and mandarin fish. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, yeah, so if you have fish like that, you absolutely want to make sure that you have live feed organisms like copepods and isopods and amphipods uh, in your system for those animals because they are, they are, they forage. Uh, a mandarin dragon net is constantly foraging for live feed organisms. Um, they can consume a lot of copepods in a day um, or isopods or, amp, you know, small newly hatched amphipods. Um, so it's, it's absolutely beneficial if you don't have a big to, to you know, constantly replenish those organisms. Um, and you can also culture them yourself and, and you, know, re, you know, supplement what's in there with, you know, your own culture. So I'm a lazy reefer and anyone that knows me will attest to that. Um, how often should I dump a bottle of 
our copepods, tiger pods, different, you know, of, 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 you know, amphipods, how often should I dump them in the tank to maintain that? If I'm not interested in raising them myself. Yeah. You know, if, if you don't have a predator that re relies on those organisms to keep them alive long-term, then, you know, basically one and done, you know, you get them in there and typically they're in your system forever. Um, and just to clarify, the, the copepods in our arctopods are not alive. We have two live copepods, Apocyclops panamensis, we call them apex pods, pods, the Tigriopus californicus. Ape, our apex pods tend to do much better at populating every square inch of a reef tank. They're very small, they reproduce rapidly, they're inconspicuous. Uh, and, you know, they, they can get into every nook and cranny of your system. And once they're in there, they're pretty much in there forever. Um, and so if you're going to add a copepod that you want in there, you know, to boost the biodiversity of your zooplankton, that's one, that's one to do it. The tigger pods, people primarily buy tigger pods as a food source. They just dump them in the, dump in the tigger pods, the tigger pods get eaten up. And then, you know, these people will buy another bottle of tigger pods and, and just keep doing that over and over again. Um, but most people are using tigger pods. They have a dragonette or they're feeding a pipefish or a seahorse and they, and they want to those animals, a live feed organism. You know, man or dragonettes will eat a pellet. You know, there's biota breeds them and they wean them onto dry feed and they don't, they don't feed them anything live while they're in their hatchery until they, you know, until they're sold. And then, you know, they're sold into, to somebody who has a reef tank and, and it's good to have those, you know, copepods available for that animal to eat because, you know, in a hatchery, you've got people working all day long, feeding those mandarins all day long, multiple feed types that are dead. But, you know, in the real world as a hobbyist, you're not doing that. So you definitely want to keep some life feed organisms in the tank for them. Mm -hmm. um, Kelly Chu has a question. Kelly. I'm going to unmute her so she can ask. Hey, Kelly. Hi. Uh, I just want to ask you because um, I have one successful batch of clownfish, but um, they, they lay their eggs here. So it's one cluster. But now they lay their eggs like that. And it's been like four to five batches and it's not really successful because after the seven day, the eggs are gone. So I would like to know if you know of what's going to happen or what happens to the, to, to the eggs. So um, after, at about six days, are you seeing them uh, kind of turning brownish and the eyes are very silver? Do you see that? Yes. Yeah, because sometimes clownfish, they'll hatch in about seven days. Um, and so it's possible that they're, that they're hatching and maybe you need to remove them like on day six if you want to raise them. Have you tried that? Um, we tried to move the parent, parent clownfish, but um, the eggs all turned white because I think it's not, we did not put any aerations into that. So we did not, uh, I did not try that after that. So the first batch that I have, I put the parent clownfish together with the eggs and it was hatching okay and currently I have a batch but subsequently after that it's not working well. So are you are you removing the the nest from the parents and putting it into a larva rearing tank? Are you removing the clay pot and putting it in its own tank? Um, the first time I tried to remove the parents but um, the eggs turned white it didn't hatch but the second time uh, the parents are together with the eggs. So um, the one particular batch, the, the eggs, they, if they are hatched, they hatch. Yeah, so what you want to do is you don't want to ever move the parents because that, that stresses them out. Um, you you want to basically like what we did at ORA was we had a tank and the parents lived in that tank for many years and they would spawn on that, on, on a floor tile or a flower pot. And then when that, when those embryos were developed far enough, you know, basically the day before they hatched and we would, you know, we had logs, we would write this down. We would know when they laid their eggs and then we could predict when they're going to hatch. And the day before they hatched, we would remove the tile or the pot and put it into a brand new larva rearing tank, like a 10 gallon tank, and then put aeration on the, on the eggs. Um, and then that keeps the eggs, you know, oxygenated, aerated. It keeps things from growing on them, fungus and stuff like that. Uh, keeps them from going white. Um, and, and then they would hatch in their own tank. So that's 
yeah, that's basically how we would do it. Okay. So uh, there's another question I want to ask because um, currently I do have a batch of uh, clownfish eggs, but uh, it was supposed to be hatched maybe today or tomorrow. But yesterday when I look at it, the, the, the eggs are all gone. So is it possible that because I only had that um, parent inside together with the eggs, so is it possible that the parents actually ate their eggs because they are stressed or is there any factors that contributes to that? Yeah, it could, I mean, it could be that they ate the eggs. Um, you know, sometimes they'll do that. Uh, but if you know, if you can, if you can get a, you know, just keep a keep a log of when they lay the eggs and when they hatch, and and maybe try pulling them out a day before that happens. Um, just you know, keep keep records of of when they're spawning. But you you definitely don't want to move the brood stock around. You don't want to move them from tank to tank. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much. Um, Chad, before we, before we wrap up, I just want to suggest um, Kevin Erickson um, brought up a suggestion that a lot of these questions that we've had tonight also, we can get answers to and, and then some at mbisite.org, which is the Marine Breeding Initiative site. Um, and it's a forum that talks about a lot of what we've been asking questions about tonight and on, on fish breeding. And, you know, uh, I was looking through their, their, their form. There's a ton of information on there also. Um, so those of you guys that have questions um, or, or are having issues, you may be able to find some answers on there also. Um, and Chad, hopefully yeah, that um, clownfish kit will be in stock. So, cause now I have another person that just said the same thing. <laughs> Yep, I'm gonna get on people when I get back to work tomorrow. Um, <laughs> and so the MBI, yeah, MBI site is awesome, and I recommend if if you really want to know more and you want to meet these people that are part of the MBI, the Marine Breeding and Marine Breeders Initiative, they have a workshop every year. So once you know the whole thing, you know passes us by and we can have this conference again, this workshop, I highly recommend it. So so keep an eye out for that workshop. Um, hopefully, there's one coming this year. If not, maybe next year. And um, there's a lot of good presentations on breeding fish. And also, there are some really good Facebook pages. There are fish breeders that get together, form these Facebook page pages, and they are very, they're, they're very good about, you know, giving advice and, and showing you videos and showing you pictures and telling you, you know, what products they're using and how they're using them. So, so talk to other breeders. Um, there, you know, there's some great people out there that are willing to, uh, to share um, and not, you know, keep everything secret. Thank you. Um, any last questions um, before we thank Chad and I introduce someone else really quickly? Uh, me, me. Eddie. <laughs> any other last questions other than Eddie? What about <laughs> hey, what call me? Okay, no, wait, wait, wait. You, uh, Chad, you mentioned two particular foods for a reef that you're saying you can feed and forget because they will reproduce forever. Can you mention those two again, please? Um, so the Apocyclops panamensis is a copepod that will breed and can populate you, can, the reef. Can, can you say that in English? <laughs> so we, we call them apex pods. Okay. And the other one? Uh, the other one, actually, that, that's pretty much the only one that, that we have that's live that would populate a reef tank. Um, Tigger pod, the other cocoa pod that, that we sell, but it, they don't typically populate. They just, they get eaten. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sean, it's me, Javier. Hey, Javier, how's it going? How are you, buddy? Hey, you. Where, where are we here in Miami? Can we find that one? The Apex pods? Uh-huh. You know, I, I'm not sure. I know Gulfstream, uh, our distributor down in Miami, they get them in uh, practically every week and they, they dole them out to stores. Um, but, you know, if you, if you're, if you have a, a local fish store that buys from Gulfstream or buys directly from us, say get them on the order next time. You know, you can prepay. There's people that pre-order corals and fish. You can pre-order pods. Yeah, I ordered through, I ordered, uh, through Karen at Exotic. And she gets them from from Gulfstream. Perfect. Okay. Uh, Javier, 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 get a couple of bottles for me too. 
Yeah, send me the name. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I already forgot. <laughs> And by the way, hey, if you guys, if, if anybody's coming to Reefa Palooza, I'm going to be there in a couple weeks, and I'm bringing live pods. So, hey, all be there. I'm a pod pusher, man. <laughs> Chuck, you remember this time is still waiting for that package in Magna. Javier, I got you. Yeah, I got you, dude. Yeah, <laughs> you <been> Reefer, Cubano. <laughs> Take care, Chad. my friend. Chad, thanks so much. I mean, this was a, a great, great. Um, presentation tonight awesome. a lot of awesome. got a lot out of it um before we we close out tonight i just want to introduce kevin kevin erickson from Mazna, the marine aquarium societies of north america you guys have heard him on here or seen him on here and i'm sure you recognize him from magnas he's the funny tall skinny guy with the hat um i don't know if he has his hat on tonight uh kevin oh, sorry around? i don't it's down. It's down. Uh, down my hallway here. I don't have my hat on. I apologize. And there's some construction going on here at my house, so that's why I've been muted. But thank you very much, Chad, and and thank you to Reed Mariculture uh, over the more than a decade now for supporting uh, some of Mazna's programs. They have a get the Mazna Speaks program, and it allows uh, and with their financial assistance, it allows uh, people to uh, have uh, like clubs to have speakers at, at their uh, events and at their meetings, uh, whether in person or virtual. So uh, thank you to uh, Chad and our continued relationship uh, with uh, with Reed Mariculture and yeah, great products, guys. And um, like I mentioned, and uh, Julio said, MBI site was uh, have their workshop. Their website was uh, MBI. Or the workshop website is mbiworkshop.org, and I'm trying to help them right now see if we can do something virtual uh, this upcoming summer, uh, so we can make sure we're continuing to uh, expand in the marine ornamental breeding space, and that will hopefully be quite uh, feasible for everyone financially. Um, and then, yes, we have um, both uh, MACNA 2021 online coming up on September 3rd to the 5th. Uh, you can go to MACNA.org to find out more information. And just last week, uh, we announced uh, MACNA 2022 will be in person. That's September 9th to the 11th. Uh, and that's in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. You also go to MACNA.org uh, to find out more information on the homepage. You can click on either 2021 or 2022. Uh, 2021 tickets online will be uh, on sale, hopefully in about three weeks. That's what I'm working on right now behind the scenes. They might have seen me look all around trying to get that launched. And we'll announce the theme uh, of that here shortly, but that will be online for September uh, 3rd to the 5th. If you were able to join us for both MACA 2021, Phoenix Rising and Mini MACA, it'll be a very similar thing going on. But thank you to AFMAS for continuing to put these uh, meetings on. I noticed there were some other people uh, throughout the world watching along uh, with myself. And so thank you to them. And if you have a chance, uh, definitely become uh, a member of FMAS. If you're not, if you're watching on Facebook, definitely, guys, go to FMAS, uh, FMAS.org or FMAS1955, right, .org and uh, become an FMAS member and renew your membership. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Kevin, Chad. Again, thank you so much. Um, and on that, guys, thank you guys for joining and for, you know, everything that, that you do. Um, for keeping the clubs going and for keeping the, the hobby going. Um, guys, join us next month. We will be here again um, with another exciting speaker and topic um, and looking forward to seeing you guys here next month. Thank I'll you, tell you guys. who it's going to do a good show. It was great. It was great. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Have a good week.